Okay, so if we make a start then, um, remember yesterday we ended up getting this equation here, the thermal diffusivity, the heat equation we called it, heat equation, and sometimes this is called the diffusion equation more generally um, because uh, we considered it in terms of heat but you could consider instead of temperature um, flowing, you could consider some chemical flowing, okay? So as we did in the first week, the way you can think about this is that you sort of have to integrate once in time and twice in space, so you're going to need an initial condition and two boundary conditions. So you could have um, boundary conditions of this form. So definition, um, if, sort of if we had, suppose we had x was on 0L for this, where L is some constant bigger than 0, then we need to have some boundary conditions. So if we had t at um, 0, comma t, suppose that was um, t0 and t at l comma t, suppose that was t little l and that's for t um, greater than, than 0. Uh, then um, that's called where t0 T, L are fixed, fixed constants. These are called Dirichlet boundary conditions. Are sometimes called fixed boundary conditions. Okay? And if T0 and TL are both equal to 0, then they're called homogeneous Dirichlet boundary conditions. So homogeneous Dirichlet boundary conditions if T of 0 equals 0 equals T of L. Okay, so that's just terminology. Okay? So what that basically means is that at the end of the rod, you've got, got the rod, and in each end of the rod, you fix the temperature. But you might also have the case where you have temperature flowing in or flowing out. So that's going to depend on the gradient. So before we go on to doing that, we have another definition, which is a definition of the directional derivative. Okay, so if we have, um, well, suppose we have um, our flux, remember, our flow, we called it Q, and suppose here was the domain, and so the normal to the domain maybe is that. So we could say the outward flow is q dot n because we could, we could um, take q and write it as q dot n plus in the, in, the, in the normal direction. So this is a normal unit normal. And then the other component of Q would be in the tangential direction, which would stay inside. So we would have that the outward, the, the outward flow is Q dot N, where N is the outward unit normal. To the surface. 
in general if we have a surface, okay? And that's called, so if Q, um, so that if you have something like this, then the directional derivative of some vector, call it, um, say you've, you've got some um, directional derivative is called dq by dn. Okay? That's just what is defined as directional derivative. Okay. So in our case, where we have zero and L, then the outward normal here is I. So the flow at X equals L outward Outward flow is Q dot I. And what was Q? Remember, Q was minus K dt by dx in the ice direction. So that means, therefore, outward flow is minus k dt by dx, okay? What about here? Outward flow, well, it's minus i dot q because the normal is in that direction. So the outward flow is, well, K, Q is still that. Dot with I is now K, dt by dx. Okay? Now, I always get confused with the signs of these, so I do a check in my head. If the outward flow is positive, it means dt by dx has to be positive here. Okay, so if dt by dx was here, remember q equals minus k dt by dx means you flow down the gradient, so that's right. You would move in that direction, so the sign is right here. Okay? This one here, flow outwards is, if that was positive, it means dt by dx would have to be negative, which means it would have to look like this. And that's right, because if it looked like this, you flow down the gradient, so you'd be flowing outwards. Okay? And so what we can do then is we can define the flow, define the flux at the boundaries. We could do that instead. And these are called Neumann boundary conditions. And so we would have like homogeneous Neumann boundary conditions. That would mean that dt by dx is equal to zero. 
at x equals 0 and at x equals L for all t bigger than 0. So that means there's no flow outwards or inwards. And then obviously we could have dt by dx equals something that's non-zero. Um, and that would be inhomogeneous boundary condition. Okay? And then finally, we could have um, what are called Robin boundary conditions. And that's a combination of the two of them. That would be saying that um, k dt by dx plus some alpha, which could depend on time, if you want to be really complicated, t equals some phi of t at x equals 0, t bigger than 0, and then um, minus dt by dx plus some beta t, t equals some of psi of t, where x equals l and t bigger than 0. And what that would mean, for example, if these were equal to naught, it would mean that the um, flow outwards depended on the temperature at, at the boundaries. Okay? And we'll mainly be dealing with um, Neumann or Dirichlet boundary conditions. Okay? So one other thing that we'll do before we actually go on and solve some of these problems is something called um, non-dimensionalization. non-dimensionalization. Hopefully I've spelled that correctly. Okay, so suppose we have dt by dt equals kappa d2t by dx squared and x, this is on the domain xl, right? <clears throat> so what we do is the following. We set x hat to be x over L tau or, or t hat to be t over tau and t hat to be t over some t naught, where the hat variables are non-dimensional. Okay? So in other words, well, this has got dimensions of, of um, space, of length. So this would have to have dimensions of length, dimensions of time. This would have dimensions of time, dimensions of temperature. This would have to dimension of temperature. Okay? So a question you would ask is, that why would you do that? Well, take L to be big L then that means our, in our new variables, um, x hat just goes from 0 to 1. So you don't have to worry about L anymore. Okay? And then the question arises, well, what should we take tau to be? Well, if we now set t hat, well, t hat, well, we got it up there. So we can, so what happens here? So d by dt, that's going to become d by dt hat, dt hat by dt, which is 1 over tau. OK? 
Okay, so this equation here is going to become, well, t naught, just substitute in big T, big T is t naught times t hat. Well, t naught's constant, take it outside. And now if we replace d by dt by d by dt hat, we have to add, we have to put in, multiply by 1 over tau. Equals, and on this side, well, we see here that every time you differentiate, you multiply by 1 over the scaling factor. Here the scaling factor is L. Differentiated twice, you get L squared. And I've missed out the T naught. Back in. And now we see we've got dt hat by d little t hat equals kappa, the t naughts cancel, tau over L squared d2 t hat by dx squared. And now we can take, take tau to be L squared over kappa. Because remember, therefore, dt hat by dt hat becomes d2t hat by dx squared, and x hat lies between 0 and 1. So now we've got rid of all the parameters. We've scaled out all the parameters. So we've made life a lot simpler for ourselves. Okay? Not only have we done that, we are now in a position where we can compare different problems. So suppose we had a rod that had length 0 to L, and suppose I was to solve for that problem. And then I was to say, right, I've solved for this problem. I know how the heat behaves on this problem from 0 to L. I know how long it takes to go to the boundaries. So that means, oh, you're, you've got a rod and it's 0 to 2 L. So that means it'll take twice the time, right, because it's 2 L. Wrong. This says the time scale for that problem is actually four times the time scale for my problem. Okay? Likewise, if you were to say, right, I've got conductivity of, um, of I've got some material with a certain conductivity for the heat, and I've, I'm going to make a rod of length L, and I know what the conductivity needs to be for that to be heated up in a nice time. Now I'm going to double the length of the rod, but I still want the heating to occur on the same time scale as the rod of length L. Then this says you're going to have to make conductivity four times the conductivity for it to fit here. So this allows you to compare completely different problems. So I said to you that um, this, we did it in the terms of heat, but this is also an equation for, um, this is also an equation you can use for diffusion. So suppose you were an organism, well indeed you are an organism, we all are organisms, and suppose you said, right, I'm just going to survive by, by diffusion of oxygen, okay? Because I don't want to have a heart, because if I have a heart, pumps blood around and that's the way to get oxygen through my body, 
I'll get a heart attack and I'll die. She'll leave me and my heart will be broken. So you having a heart is a horrible thing. Get rid of the heart. Just survive by diffusion alone. Just walk through the world and have diffusion, oxygen diffused through you. Wonderful. Okay? So oxygen, diffusion coefficient of oxygen depends what you're diffusion through, diffusing through, but it's roughly speaking 2 times 10 to minus 5 centimeters squared per second. So suppose you, the organism is roughly speaking a millimeter in diameter. then what's the time scale of the diffusion? The time scale of the diffusion is L squared divided by D. This is centimeters, so we better put this in centimeters, 10 to the minus 1 L squared 10 to minus 1 seconds. What does that turn out to be? That turns out to be approximately, let's think about that, um, this becomes 10 to the 3 divided by 2. Oh yeah, sorry, so millimetres going to centimetres. So one millimeter is 10 to the minus one centimeters. Yeah, so we've got L squared over D. Okay, and so one millimeter, so we have to have the units the same. So one millimeter is a tenth of a centimeter. So then that becomes L squared, 10 to minus 1 times 10 to minus 1, divided by that, which becomes in seconds, okay? And that becomes 10 times 10 times 10, divided by 2 um, seconds, okay? Which then, if we want to convert to, what's that? That's, rough, that's roughly speaking some hours, isn't it? A few hours, right? So that's doable, isn't it? I think that's right. Yeah, so 10 times, it's roughly speaking that, divide by 60 to get minutes, divide by 60 to get hours. So it's roughly speaking a few hours, okay? Suppose you were an elephant and tried to do the same thing. Now what's going to happen? Now L is a meter, which is a thousand times this. So now your time scale is going to be a million times this. So it's going to take a million hours for any oxygen to diffuse into the center of your body. And probably you'll be dead before that oxygen can get through. So what this calculation is telling us is at what size do organisms have to start having structures that can actively move nutrients and oxygen around. And that's why you don't see large, simple organisms. 
as soon as an organism becomes bigger than roughly speaking one millimeter in diameter it has to have complicated systems for moving nutrient and oxygen around. Now another organism that you can think of as an organism is cancer. And when cancer, when it becomes roughly speaking one millimeter in diameter, it starts to die in the center because there's not enough oxygen. And what the cancer cell do, cells do then is they form their own vasculature by hijacking the vasculature of the body and building their own vasculature and their own vasculature because it's immature to begin with there's holes in the vasculature and the cells can move into the vasculature and then flow to different parts of the body and that's called metastasis secondary tumor and so you see here we're talking about length scales of one millimeter, which are very difficult to detect, right? I mean, you wouldn't notice from doing this that there's a lump of one millimeter on your body. But if oxygen, if the diffusion coefficient of oxygen was much larger, so that maybe you could grow to a centimeter before you needed a blood supply, then you would be able to detect it and get it removed before it did any harm. So this very, very simple calculation, very naive calculation, actually gives you quite an insight into nature, biology, and medicine. So the non-dimensionalization, on the one hand, is helpful, it makes the problem simpler. On the other hand, it gives a lot of insight into the mechanism and um, what you can conclude for what might be going on, okay? Without doing any calculation, basically. So now we're going to move on to actually solving some problems. And in fact, we've already done these before, but now, now we'll put these in the context. So now we're going to consider um, heat conduction. In a finite rod. Oh, and I should mention that talking about the medical implications of this sort of stuff here, that that's then done in the third year course, math, Further Mathematical Biology. Okay, so remember dt by dt equals kappa d2t by dx squared. x is an element of zero L. And let's assume for this one uh, that we have um, Assume T of 0T equals T of LT for all T bigger than 0. Then that's called um, a homogeneous Dirichlet boundary conditions. And then we do the usual thing. And we, we did this a couple of weeks ago. Look for separable solution. Okay. And um, boundary conditions imply that F of naught must be F of L must be naught. Okay, if we wanted to, we could non-dimensionalize, but we'll, we'll not. We'll just do it the way here. Notice, why do we take this? Because the boundary condition is telling us f of naught times g of t equals naught. And so if we didn't take f of naught to be naught, then g of t would have to be naught for all t, which would mean that t would have to be naught 
for all t, which is a solution to the problem. But we're trying to find more interesting solutions to the problem. Okay? And then we do the usual thing, substitute in, separate out the variables, and we get um, f double dashed over kappa over f equals g dashed over g. And now I'm abusing notation by here having dashed be d by dx, here having dashed to be d by dt. Okay, and then we do the usual thing. So you can either say, well, both of these must be constants then. And then the question is, is the constant positive or is it negative? And then you can decide what it is you want, the way you want to go ahead with this. You could first of all say, well, suppose the constant was zero. Then that means f double dashed is zero, which means f is ax plus b. The boundary conditions give you zero. Suppose f double dashed over f was positive constant. That gives you hyperbolic sines and cosines. Evaluated at zero and l to get zero has to be zero. So we're left with the only case is where this is negative. Or you could do the trick I told you, which is multiply you know, the, the trick we had um, where we said f double dashed equals const, constant, call it omega times f, then multiply by f and integrate, and then use the boundary conditions to find out that the only non-zero solution you can have is if omega is negative, okay? Because when you integrate this by parts and use the boundary conditions, you end up getting minus the integral from 0 to L f dashed squared. So you basically got minus the integral of f dashed squared equals omega the integral of f squared, which means that either f and f dashed are equivalent to 0 or omega is negative. You do one of the two. So we did that last time. And what we end up getting then is t of x, t. And here I'm, I'm sort of skipping a lot of steps because we did them before. n pi x over l e to the minus n squared pi squared kappa t over l squared. OK? And that, remember, is because we say um, has to be sines and cosines. This boundary condition means that the cosine term has to be 0. So you have to have sine. And then the only way to get a non-zero is to have sine n pi x over l. OK? And look, here's a funny thing. Kappa t over L squared occurs all together. Kappa t over L squared. See? So it's not a funny thing. It should come out that way. If it didn't, we would have made a mistake somewhere. OK? And so now we need to solve, we need initial conditions. So suppose initial conditions are t of x 0 equals sum f of x for um, x um, element of 0, l. And then we can do the usual thing of the Fourier convergence theorem. Okay, so what we can do is we can then um, extend this, do the um, periodic extension, and since it's a sine series, it would have to be the odd periodic extension of f of x. 
And then we get, so because I've, I've skipped a step, that equals f of x equals the sum, n goes from 1 to infinity, a n sine n pi x over L, because the E becomes 1, and we want to find the a n, so that's a Fourier series. That's a Fourier cosine, a Fourier sine series. So basically, we want the Fourier sine series of f. Okay? And we know the answer to that is a n equals um, 2 over L, integral from naught to L, f of x sine n pi x over L dx. Okay, that's the using the Fourier sine series. Okay? And if you don't remember that, just integrate from naught to L, multiply by sine n pi x over L. And then here you'll get integrals from naught to L sine n pi x over L times sine m pi x over L. And then that's going to be 0 unless n equals m. Okay? So there's your answer. Equals that thing there. 2 over L. times e okay so what happens here as t goes to infinity big t will go to 0 So what that's telling us is that if we, on each side of the boundary, have fixed conditions of zero, then if we put some heat at the beginning, the rod is heated in some way. As t goes to infinity, all that heat will disappear. And we'll go to zero temperature. Because the heat will leave the boundary. So it doesn't matter what your initial condition F is. This is what will go on. Okay? Now, if we have zero flux boundary conditions, so now consider example zero flux boundary conditions. Now, I'll leave you to go through the details, but basically the difference now is going to be we've got dt by dx is zero at x equals zero, x equals L for all t bigger than zero. And so that means we want in a separable solution f dashed of 0 to be f dashed of L to be 0. And so now we go through the whole thing again, and we see that we must have, this time, the Fourier cosine solution. Usual argument. implies t of xt becomes a naught over 2 plus the sum n goes from 1 to infinity a n cos n pi x over L times e to the minus n squared pi squared kappa t over L squared. So I've just realized that in the past we've been calling this Bn. So sorry about changing that to An. And then 
what do we know? A naught is 2 over L, oh, integral from 0 to L, the initial condition, which is f of x dx, and the a n is 2 over L, integral from 0 to L, f of x cos n pi x over L dx for n bigger than naught. So that's the Fourier cosine series. So we've used the Fourier cosine formula to get that. Okay? And now the question here is what happens as t goes to infinity? And so what's t of xt as t goes to infinity? Well, in this case, um, all these terms will disappear. Because again, you've got e to the minus something times t as t goes to infinity that goes to 0. And we're left with a constant, which is 1 over l integral from 0 to l f of x dx. Okay? Now, physically, does that make sense? So, you start off with some heat, and you don't let the heat go away. Okay? So, the heat must be conserved. So if we start off, then what you, we've got the total heat, total heat is integral from naught to L, T of x, T dx. So what's the rate of change of that? So let's call that this T of T. So d t by dt, using Leibniz, is that. Use the heat equation, it's that. d2t by dx squared dx. Integrate that. which is 0 by the Neumann boundary conditions. So that means the heat is conserved. So what's T of 0? T of 0 is 1 over L integral from 0 to L f of x dx. So that must be conserved. So now we're a bit panicky and we see, well, the total heat that we got as t went to infinity, oh, look, it's the same as that. So it's conserved. So a question to ask is, so basically, all the heat flattened out, regardless of the initial conditions. Why did that happen? So suppose we started off with this being our initial condition for T. And now, first of all, let's do this thinking about it physically. Heat moves down temperature gradient. So the heat is going to start to diffuse out from here and out from here. So it's going to start to flatten. It can't leave the boundary, so it's going to accumulate at the boundary. And eventually it's going to flatten out to be level. 
But in all of this, the area is conserved. So it'll flatten out like this. Okay. Think about it as a mathematician. What's d2t by dx squared here? This is a maximum, so it's negative. So dt, dt by dt is negative. So that's going to decrease. Okay. So if there's a maximum anywhere, it will decrease. If there's a minimum anywhere, d2t by dx squared will be positive. So it'll increase. So any minimum, any maximum will decrease, and any minimum will increase. And it'll keep on going until you just got a flat um, solution. Okay? So the solution we calculated from doing the Fourier series to find out as a solution as t goes to infinity, you get this solution that's constant, we now see why that makes sense both physically and mathematically from looking at this equation. Okay? And this final solution that we get, t equals constant, we call that a steady state. of the problem. So steady state means it doesn't change in time. Okay? So if you were asked, calculate the steady states of this problem, you would say steady state means time derivative is zero. So dt by dt equals zero at the steady state. That implies well, now it's total derivative because big T doesn't depend on little t, it just depends on x. Integrate that, t becomes ax plus b. Boundary condition implies a is zero. Boundary condition is dt by dx is 0 at the two boundaries. Well, dt by dx is a, so a must be 0. So that tells us our steady state is t equals b. And how do we find b? We use the conservation. So what this tells us is that if we have diffusion and if we start off with any spatial structure in our temperature, diffusion will wipe that out and just give you flat. Okay? So diffusion wipes out spatial pattern. Now, this is way beyond the course. This is going into third year. And I'm giving you examples from mathematical biology because I'm a mathematical biologist. Um, so this has got nothing to do with this course, OK? But it's to do if you go into third year. So you've all, I assume, heard of Alan Turing. So towards the end of his lifetime, he became a mathematical biologist. And he was looking for how does spatial structure form in our body? How do we get bones? How do animals get patterns, coat markings, everything like that? And he said, well, there must be some chemical that forms the structure that tells the cells, you, you turn black, you turn yellow, and then we'll have a nice spotted animal. Okay? So the question then was, how do you get this nice spatial structure of the chemicals? And he said, easy, that spatial structure rises by diffusion. 
oh dear, we just showed spatial structure is destroyed by diffusion. And you think if you take a glass of water and you put in some blue ink, you see a spatial structure, little blob of ink, come back a few minutes later, spatial structure is gone. You just see blue water. Diffusion destroys spatial structure. But that's only if you've got one thing diffusing. So our intuition that diffusion destroys pattern is based on one chemical or one heat. And the genius of Turing was that he showed that if you have multiple things diffusing under certain conditions, diffusion could create structure. And 40 years later on, people in chemistry showed that that could happen. So there's an example of the incredible genius of Turing, that while we all know that diffusion destroys pattern, he realized that was only for the case of one thing diffusing. And when you have other things diffusing and interacting with each other, diffusion could cause pattern to form. And so this is why you should all take the third year course on mathematical biology. Okay, so, um, right. So what we will do next time, so what we've done here now is we've, we've solved the equation. We've seen now how we can use um, our um, ideas that we did in the f in first week in order to now solve these problems. And what we will do uh, next time is there's still this issue that we've said, look for a solution to the form F times G. But what happens if there is a solution that's not of the form F times G? Right? We've made all these, we've just assumed this is the answer. So what we will show next time is that the solution to this problem is unique. And therefore, having found a solution, it's the solution. So therefore, we're justified in making all these conclusions from this solution that we found, because it is the solution. Right? So what we'll do next time is prove the uniqueness of this. Right? So we should now be in a position where you should be able to do the first four problem sheets um, of the... Um, uh, the problem sheet, and probably um, if I just look at problem sheet five, I can remember what that's on. Okay, so problem sheet five also does some heat equation stuff, so you should be able to do some of problem sheet five um, as well, okay? The, at least the first two questions of problem sheet five.